Now, next speaker for today's uh, presentation, YPF presentation, is Dr. Metrani Samira Vijayasekar Patirana, Senior Registrar in Endocrinology in National Hospital of Sri Lanka. She'll be talking to us on primary aldosteronism. Commonly overlooked, often missed. Are we doing it? Over to you, Dr. Metrani. Good afternoon to you all. First of all, I would like to thank Ceylon College of Physicians for giving me this opportunity to talk about primary aldosteronism, a commonly overlooked open misdiagnosis in the current era. So without further ado, I will move on to my objectives. I only have four objectives which are very simple. That is to highlight the importance of diagnosing primary aldosteronism. Second, to redefine primary aldosteronism as a syndrome with a spectrum rather than a categorical uh, disease with a yes and no answer. And second, to simplify the screening and diagnostic testing in PA as much as possible. Thirdly, to give, uh, fourthly, to give you an brief overview on the PA management. So, uh, in the today's world, where there is a raging uh, non communicable disease epidemic, hypertension plays a big role. Hypertension affects 1.3 billion people worldwide. To give you an idea about how bad this number is, uh, we know diabetes is common. We uh, see a lot of diabetes patients. The prevalence of diabetes is in one in every 10 patients will be having diabetes. But hypertension, uh, one in every four adults in the world are suffering from hypertension. So it's almost twice the number of diabetic, diabetic patients. And but for hypertension, uh, to make the matters worse, only fewer than one in five patients have their blood pressure under control. And as a result, hypertension is the number one risk factor for deaths globally. So out of this 1.3 billion people, about 10% patients with hypertension has an underlying secondary cause. And out of those secondary causes also, primary aldosteronism is the commonest. So this is a study done in primary care setting where they are they screened for primary aldosteronism in all hypertensive patients. The prevalence was uh, found to be about 6%. This prevalence can uh, does vary between studies to 5 to 10%. And depending on the study population, again, the prevalence can change. So why... So I hope that now you can understand it is a common disorder, even though at our medical student days, we rarely, it is categorized as a rare disease. But why is it important to diagnose primary aldosteronism? Compared to essential hypertensive counterparts with the same control of blood pressure, primary aldosteronism patients have more comorbidities. And at the same time, if we diagnose primary aldosteronism uh, in a timely manner, that is early in the disease, we can effectively treat the, the patients by doing surgery or starting mineral fortified receptor antibodies, which will effectively reduce the morbidity and mortality. So that is reason enough to screen, diagnose PA at an early stage. So a little bit about the long-term effects of PA, uh, primary aldosteronism, aldosteron itself causes high blood pressure and in addition to the blood pressure effect, there are uh, various effects uh, because of aldosterone excess as well. So it involves in the cardiovascular system, uh, there is increased risk of atrial fibrillation and then coronary artery disease, stroke risk is heightened. And also in the kidney, it causes a hyperfiltration, which can lead to microalbuminuria and chronic kidney disease. And uh, primary aldosteronism can be labeled as a condition with uh, chronic inflammation. So uh, your metabolic health is affected by primary aldosteronism. Uh, the risk, there is associated increased insulin resistance as well as uh, more and more PA patients are, are going to develop type 2 diabetes in the future. And at the same time, obstructive sleep apnea is common in PA patients. A little note here, obstructive sleep apnea and PA has a bidirectional association where PA uh, is common in obstructive sleep apnea patients as well. And then lastly, about a little known fact about primary aldosteronism, it causes significant impact on calcium and bone health. 
where due to hyperfiltration, it can cause hypercalciuria, and uh, as a result, in predisposed patient, it can lead to renal capillary disease. At the same time, it can cause secondary osteoporosis if untreated for a long time. So uh, this is a study done uh, among essential hypertensives and PA patients where they have looked at the target organ damage in the form of left ventricular hypertrophy, microalbuminuria, and cardiovascular events, which are mainly MIs, strokes, and heart failure. So uh, the blue bars denotes the primary aldosteronism patients. Uh, sorry, blue bars denotes the essential hypertensives, whereas uh, green bars denotes the primary aldosteronism patient. So you can see clearly the number of uh, percentage of PA patients are almost twice the number of essential hypertensive patients suffering from these comorbidities. So PA is common and it causes significant endogen damage. So as professionals treating hypertensives, are we doing enough to diagnose this common and easily treated disease? Uh, but to say the least, PA is terribly underdiagnosed. Under the major reason behind this is inadequate screening because the diagnosis starts with the screening. Even in the resource-rich uh, settings like USA, the screening rates are as low as 2%. Unfortunately, I don't have any uh, evidence for Sri Lanka data, but I don't think we are doing any better. So, uh, to tackle this problem, we should identify what are the reasons behind this underdiagnosis of primary aldosteronism. Over the past two decades, there had been massive knowledge expansion on the PA pathophysiology, testing, and management. However, there is a knowledge gap in the medical community with regard to the current PA landscape. And also, if you can remember, the diagnostic procedure looks cumbersome for PA. I agree. And there are concerns. Sometimes your patients are having resistant hypertension. You have concerns about modifying antihypertensives for testing. Uh, so, and PA lacks easily identifiable. This is specific clinical features. So or your PA patient can be basically essential hypertensive. And then lastly, at the moment, we are suffering from cost of lack cost and lack of resources at the moment. But however, the first three uh, reasons where I have highlighted, for these three, we can take measures to counteract these uh, reasons. So uh, let's move on. Uh, if you can remember, my second objective was to uh, describe primary aldosteronism as a syndrome with the spectrum rather than a categorical disease where you take arbitrary cutoff value and diagnose or exclude primary aldosteronism. So before going into that, I would like to remind you a little bit of physiology. That is uh, renin angiotensin aldosterone system. The uh, rate limiting factor here is the renin, which is stimulated by uh, hypertension, hypovolemia, hyperkalemia, and sympathetic stimuli, which ultimate, uh, with the activation of this cascade, the ultimate result is the aldosterone production by the sona glomerulosa. So uh, with the aldosterone secretion, there is uh, volume expansion and blood pressure normalized. And in a feedback uh, manner, it inhibits renin secretion. This occurs in healthy people. But in primary aldosteronism, the problem starts where the sonar glomerulosa starts producing aldosterone uh, independent of renin. So it could be adrenal adenoma. It could be adrenal hyperplasia, where there is autonomous uh, aldosterone secretion. Uh, which leads to volume expansion and uh, sodium retention. In turn, they act on uh, act in a feedback inhibitory manner, decreasing renin level. So in primary aldosteronism, you have the first thing is you have increased aldosterone, then you have decreased renin. So even in 1954, where Conan and colleagues described their first ever primary aldosteronism case, they describe these cardinal three features where you have suppression of baseline renin, inability to stimulate renin, secretion normally, and inappropriate and unsuppressible aldosterone secretion despite uh, sodium and volume expansion. So uh, if you can remember your early days as a medical student, we were taught to think about primary aldosteronism only in hypertensives. But current studies prove that it is not so. PA, is seen, a PA phenotype is seen even in normotension. So this is a study done in early 2000 where they uh, uh, took participants from the community and who were normotensive at that 
time, then did plasma DNA in activity and aldosterone. And they were followed up for a long time until the development of hypertension. So in this uh, study, they found three renin-related phenotypes. That is suppressed renin phenotype, unsuppressed renin phenotype, and the indeterminate renin phenotype. Here, in the suppressed renin, renin phenotype, what they noticed was more and more patients developed hypertension as the time goes by compared to other two phenotypes. And this occurred irrespective of the aldosterone level. So in the other end of spectrum, you have resistant hypertensive patients. So this start the two trial was done in resistant hypertensive patients where they checked for the fourth optimal treatment of resistant hypertension. What is the fourth drug we can give? They checked the spandactone, placebo, bisoprolol, and doxycycline. And uh, mind you, they, in, at the beginning of the study, they excluded primary aldosteronism by conventional biochemical threshold. And uh, what they found was spironolactone was found to be the most effective drug. And the effect of uh, spironolactone was maximally seen when the renin levels are suppressed. So uh, what we can take from this study is even in resistant hypertension where we have excluded PA with the current threshold, there may be subset of patients who are still having the uh, underlying primary aldosteronism, which we might have missed by our diagnosis. So the PA uh, might be milder subclinic, at subclinical level. There could be other components contributing to their hypertension. So uh, with this evidence, we can discuss about this spectrum of PA syndrome, where at one end, you have severe hypertensive patients with hypokalemia and endorgan damage uh, with, the clinic, with the clinical features of mineralocorticoid receptor activation. And then uh, their biochemical confirmation of these PA patients are easy with the current threshold. However, in the uh, other spectrum, you have the normal tensive patients who doesn't have any features suggestive of mineral corticoid receptor activation. And using current uh, biochemical diagnostic threshold, we are unable to diagnose PA in these patients. But however, if you do renin and aldosterone level, they will have suppressed renin with elevated aldosterone uh, concentrations. So, and there is an inter, uh, intermediate type as well. So, primary aldosterone, I hope you can understand that primary aldosteronism should be considered as a syndrome with spectrum and beyond overt uh, primary aldosteronism, which we commonly diagnose at the moment, there is a continuum of renin-independent aldosterone production where severity can range from mild to severe. This spectrum exceeds beyond our traditional diagnostic threshold and is therefore under-recognized. So if you are to take one take home message from all this I have been telling, pathogenesis of PA is renin-independent aldosterone production. If you can remember this, you will be uh, able to easily interpret the diagnostic testing, which I will discuss later uh, now. Screening for primary aldosteronism. Some uh, experts on the uh, field of primary aldosteronism uh, advise that every hypertensive patient should be screened at least once in a lifetime uh, for primary aldosteronism because it's common. But for a country like Sri Lanka, cost of such a screening is going to be massive and it is going to be prohibitive. So for a country like ours, what is the best strategy? What population will give the highest deal and will benefit more from screening? There comes the importance of looking at prevalence in PEA in different patient populations. So here you can see I have highlighted few. Stage 1 hypertension, prevalence of PEA in the studies ranged from 39 to 15.7%. However, if you look at resistant hypertensives, the rate, the prevalence rate almost doubles. And also in the hypertension and hypokalemia, almost 30% patients are suffering from PA. Here, I would like to make a little note. Previously, it was told hypertension and hypokalemia needs to be there for you to screen for primary aldosterone. It is not so. Only 30% of PA patients will have hypokalemia. So, and other thing is, uh, even with just hypokalemia and in normal tensive patients, there is enough evidence there may be underlying PA, uh, primary aldosterone going on. So 
If you have hypertension and hyperkalemia, obviously screening is indicated. Even without that, you can screen for PA. And other thing is hypertension and atrial fibrillation with the structurally normal hearts. It is about prevalence is almost 42%. And then hypertension and obstructive sleep apnea, uh, closer to 9% prevalence was seen. So depending on these high-risk populations where prevalence of PA is high, 2016 Endocrine Society guideline recommend screening for PA in seven patient groups. Uh, most of our I will, uh, most of our patients will belong to this first group where are moderate to, where they are suffering from moderate to severe hypertension. Uh, you have to first, you have to make sure the patients are compliant with our medication. Still, if they are suffering from moderate to severe hypertension, I have mentioned the indication and the specific requirements separately here. So you have to screen for primary aldosteronism. And other seven groups, uh, other uh, six populations are also mainly the patients with high risk for PA. Uh, this list you can find from anywhere. And then moving, once you have diagnosed, uh, identified the people for who needs uh, screening for primary aldosteronism, it starts with doing aldosterone renin ratio. Then as all things endocrinology, we have an algorithm for this. So we have second, we have confirmatory testing. There are four tests, but at the moment, usually uh, in our setup, we use saline loading test uh, because of the availability of specific uh, biochemical testing and also oral salt loading, which is easily done in uh, as an outpatient can be done. And also, once you have confirmed PA, there is a last step called subtype classification. That is, you look whether this is a unilateral uh, problem of the adrenal or bilateral disease. That is done by using adrenal CT and adrenal venous sampling. So, uh, the latest guideline we have on PA is in 2016 Endocrine Society Guidelines. They recommend using aldosterone renin ratio as a screening tool. The diagnostic cutoff of ARE is 20 to 30. This 20 to 30 comes because of different assays we use in renin measurement. So there is a little bit of a problem with using just ARR as a screening tool. In the, I have given three cases here, all are having ARR of 30. But if you take the first case, uh, you have... And also, you should remember the cardinal three features of primary aldosteronism here. In the first case, you have subrestraining. Plasma aldosterone is high. There is no issue diagnosing primary aldosteronism in this first case. But however, if you move on to the second case, again, ARR is 30. Uh, if you go by the cut, uh, ARR alone, this is primary aldosteronism. But unfortunately, even though plasma renin is suppressed, uh, plasma aldosterone is again low. So in this case, labeling this as primary aldosteronism is difficult, is problematic. And third one, uh, of course, you have null suppressed renin of 2 with high aldosterone of 60, giving the ARR of 30. So here also you can see the problem with diagnosing primary aldosteronism uh, if we remember our three cardinal features. So... Uh, Newest screening recommendations, so although we don't have a specific guideline recommending this, we have a lot of publications on this, uh, to look at the plasma renin first. And if it is suppressed, then you look at the plasma aldosterone. If it is high, the cutoff is more than 10 nanograms per deciliter. This is PA unless proven otherwise. And if your renin is not suppressed, then PA is unlikely it is excluded. So rather than going for just ARR, I would like you all to look at the uh, individual components of ARR uh, when you see the pre see a report next time. So once the, there are several challenges associated with doing ARR. One is if you have abundant abundance of resources, ARR can be performed even without any prior preparation as the patient walks into your clinic visit. But in our setup, because of cost, we need to prepare our patients meticulously. That involves usually admission, and at the same time, early morning being a sample in an ambulatory patient who had been mobile for at least two hours after waking up and who had been on an unrestricted dietary sodium and also who is in potassium replete state. And ideally, we would like to modify our antihypertensives uh, so that they won't interfere with ARR interpretation. This includes using non-dihydropyridine non calcium channel blockers, alpha blockers, and hydrolysine. 
At the same time, we are using a lot of SGLT2 inhibitors these days, which can cause uh, dehydration, which will falsely elevate the renin level when you are doing ARR. So you have to be aware about this as well. So if you can't optimize, what will happen if you can't optimize your patient? So uh, So uh, there are patients who are having resistant hypertension. We have a problem uh, omitting spironolactone or AZ inhibitors. Even in these patients, you can do ARR and interpret because all these drugs will upregulate the renin in the RAA system normally and will cause false negative ARR. But however, while even while on spironolactone, if you do the ARR and the renin levels are suppressed, with high aldosterone levels, it is indicative of PA. So I would like to remind you that when you are doing ARR in medical boards, we would prefer if you can note down the drugs patient is on at the time of ARR, as well as to document the level of potassium at that time. So interpretation, uh, the false negative ARR testing can be avoided. And then, uh, who need, uh, then following screening, we need to confirm who needs confirmatory testing. All screening positive patients need confirmatory testing, but in those with hypo, spontaneous hypokalemia, suppressed training, and aldosterone level of more than 20 nanograms per deciliter, this is enough evidence to, for you to say this is over primary aldosteronism, nothing else. So in those, we don't do confirmatory testing. Following confirmatory testing, as I mentioned earlier, we need to go for subtype classification that is done mainly by adrenal CT followed by a adrenal venous sampling. Adrenal CT usually aldosterone producing adenoma tend to be small less than two centimeter, and they are usually lipid rich with having low CT attenuation indicated indicated by less than ten Hausfeld units. And uh, if you have the second thing, second investigation would be to go for adrenal venous sampling. This is the gold standard test for subtype classification. Uh, however, it needs international radiology, and uh, it, does, it doesn't mean that each and every patient with PA needs to undergo AVS. In who can we skip AVS? Less than 35 clear evidence of PA in the form of spontaneous hypokalemia, suppressed renin, and high aldo, more than 30 nanograms per deciliter, who are having a lipid rich adenoma, less than 2 cm, with a normal contralateral adrenal. We are pretty sure the culprit lesion is the one we see in the CT. So we can directly go for adrenalectomy. And in addition to that, if there is ACNTH independent cortisol production or CT evidence that uh, for adrenocortical carcinoma, you don't need to go behind PA. Other, these indications are good enough for you to go in with adrenalectomy. And lastly, there are subcategory of patients who are not willing or fit enough for surgery, even if we localize. In those also, we can skip ABS. And Management following uh, subtype classification. Uh, so, ABS <coughs> guided local ABS, it's beyond the scope of this presentation to discuss about ABS. So, once we, with the ABS, we can find out whether this is a unilateral disease. If so, the treatment would be to go for laparoscopic adrenalectomy. If it is bilateral disease, then the medical treatment with mineralocorticoid receptor agonist, we will start. So, a little bit about the adrenalectomy for unilateral PA. Clinical key of following adrenalectomy is not guaranteed in all. However, there are certain factors which will predict clinical success following surgery, which are young patients, shorter duration of hypertension, and fever antihypertensives and female sex. So, what this uh, here lies the importance of diagnosing PA in the early, early stages. So, we can have a clin clinical success following adrenalectomy. And the blood pressure response of uh, adrenalectomy can take up to about one to three months after surgery. But however, hypokalemia will resolve immediately after successful surgery. So, a little bit about the medical treatment of PA. In this graph, you can see risk of adverse outcomes are more when you have suppressed training. But so in our treatment, we need to target an unsuppressed training level for an optimal cardiovascular risk reduction. So our target in medical management would be to normalize the blood pressure, 
normalize the serum potassium without replacement, and lastly, to have non-suppressed training levels, which is achieved by dietary sodium restriction and chronic mineral corticoid receptor antagonist treatment in the form of spironolactone and epiletinone. If your patient is intolerant to mineral corticoid receptor agonist, you can try amyloid or ENAC channel blocker as well. So that brings me to the end of my lecture. I have few take-home messages. First, now is uh, time to think about primary aldosteronism as a syndrome that manifests across the continuum of severity rather than a disease with yes and no answer. Last, uh, then, diagnosing PK is important considering its widespread uh, the prevalence, associated comorbidities, and easily available and successful treatment options. Then, screening for PA using ARR should involve interpreting uh, aldosterone and renin levels separately rather than, the, rather than just the ratio. And lastly, testing for PA ideally requires a well-prepared patient, but even if you don't have the optimal condition, the interpretation of aldosterone renin level, uh, ARR can be done as long as renin is suppressed. So that's all I would like to thank for your kind attention. And if you have any questions, I'm happy to ask. Thank you, Dr. Netrani. Uh, it's open for questions. Thank you for that presentation. I mean, we can use the interest about OSA and uh, should, be, uh, should we screen all patients who are hypertensive with OSA patients who are hypertensive? And it's, it's, it's common. And uh, do you look for OSA in all patients with the what's the intense and the pattern of the uh, Yes, sir. To answer your question, so it's a bidirectional association. Uh, the PA is more prevalent in obstructive sleep apnea patients, so it is warranted. It's one of the indications. If your patient is suffering from obstructive sleep apnea, they recommend to screen for primary aldosteronism. And the mechanism mainly lies behind the uh, increase, like primary aldosteronism lead to a state of volume expansion. So with that, you can get the... Uh, the Laryngeal, the congestion uh, is in the result of that. And in addition to that, the metabolic uh, it's a chronic inflammatory condition, primary aldosteronism. Uh, so, in that sense, there is a company metabolic syndrome in most of those primary aldosteronism patients. It also can contribute to obstructive sleep apnea in primary aldosteronism. Right. Uh, that is. Yes, yes, sir. Um, the very good is like yeah. So, association which the mention about the that they studied that subgroup uh, for autonomous thoughts or situation. Uh, I am not you on top of that whether there is thoughts or not. So Yes, sir. Uh, I can't. The studies I have, I uh, looked at, they didn't specifically mention about the cortisol, but most of the time when we are doing PA investigation, we tend to exclude OD, uh, cortisol excess by doing more DSD. Sir, so. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Okay, uh, thank you very much for that, and please accept our uh, certificate of appreciation.